thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Marcus, and we'll start off with the video, and then Peter, who is our CEO of Ipsos Business Consulting, will make an introduction, and then I'll go into the presentation slides for today. ASEAN is the world's fifth largest automotive market. Only China, the USA, the EU, and Japan are larger. And it's not just a vast market, but a global production hub too manufacturing some 4 million cars and trucks per year. And that's not all. The motorcycle industry thrives in ASEAN, with 10 million sold a year. Indonesia alone accounts for nearly 80% of these sales. And Vietnam is famous the world over for its people's use of motorbikes. The Philippines is an automotive market to watch, with the highest growth of vehicle sales in the region in recent years. This is in line with the country's overall domestic growth which has made it a star in the region. Malaysia offers investors a secure base from which to launch ASEAN automotive projects. Currently, the domestic market is dominated by two national brands, which account for almost half the total vehicle sales. But this is said to decrease, given strong competition from Japanese manufacturers. Indonesia is working hard to justify its place as ASEAN's second automotive production hub and is expected to replace Thailand as number one at the start of the next decade. But for the time being, Thailand remains the dominant automotive hub in ASEAN, hosting the best logistics chain in Southeast Asia. It's a production hub capable of manufacturing automotive components fit for use in any supply chain around the world. Half its production is exported to overseas markets. For years, Thailand was characterized as a one-ton pickup truck market, and over 50% of vehicle sales still occur in this segment. But this is changing as the market continues to mature. In recent years, for instance, more than one in seven sales have been eco-cars. All in all, ASEAN's automotive industry possesses huge potential, as its 10 member states continue to focus on jobs, prosperity, and the creation of a common market it's definitely a region in which to build, compete, and grow. That was, by the way, our first attempt at a video. <clears throat> so we're quite, quite happy with it. Anyway, good afternoon. As Marcus said, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedules to come here um, and hear what we've got to say about the automotive market in uh, Indonesia and Thailand. Um, today, as we have had in the previous venues, we've done this in Tokyo, in Seoul, in Pattaya, and in Jakarta. Um, we've got people from a disparate, uh, you know, whole range of different parts of the industry. Uh, everything from people who are interested in what I always refer to as the shiny cars, which is the first thing everybody thinks about, to people who are involved in the uh, in the spare parts industries, the components, the coatings, the chemicals, and even the financing. Of the, of the vehicle, so the whole, uh, the whole range of issues. <clears throat> I'm not sure how much you know about uh, Ipsos Business Consulting, but uh, most people have probably never heard of us. We're uh, the part of Ipsos, the, the, market, the global market research company, that just focuses on business-to-business -business issues. So we're, we're, we're not in the B2C business, we're in the B2B business. Um, and there are brochures available to give you a, a, a good idea about the other stuff, the complete range of things that we do. Um, today, my, Marcus and I uh, will be, Marcus leads our automotive practice globally, by the way. Uh, we will be uh, sharing some detailed insights on uh, Indonesia and uh, Thailand. And I guess the question that a lot of people would ask is why Indonesia and Thailand? Um, and perhaps you've just seen the video um, but Indonesia and Thailand are the two largest economies in ASEAN. Out of the ten, these two account for half of the population and half of the GDP. In fact, more than half of the GDP. Indonesia is effectively the 400-pound gorilla of ASEAN. It's like Brazil in... It's, it's the equivalent of Brazil in Latin America. Um, ASEAN itself, people don't often put it into the correct perspective, but ASEAN itself represents a combined GDP of 2.6 trillion uh, US dollars, depending on exchange rates at any given point in time, but somewhere around about that, and a population of 622 million people. So collectively, that makes it the third largest economy in, uh, in Asia, 
behind China and Japan. But it makes it the seventh largest grouping if you put it together as a group in the world. And the reason you increasingly people will be thinking about it as a group is that there is the ASEAN Free Trade Agreement coming in now, which is going to facilitate a, a lot of uh, development that will be actually pan-ASEAN. Um, Indonesia, another quick factoid. Uh, Indonesia is the fourth most populous country in the world after China, India, the United States. So it's, it's going to be a big market to keep continuing to grow and advance. Uh, ASEAN is growing strongly compared to the rest of the world, so it's a, a very interesting area. Uh, I personally lived in Thailand for nine years, from uh, 1987 to 1996, and in that time I saw the auto industry in Thailand develop from uh, what started out as just uh, assembling CKDs, completely knocked down kits, um, there, to actually having uh, major production facilities with, with large amounts of local content, as you saw from the video um, in, in it. And it sort of fulfilled the Board of Investment's dream of making the eastern seaboard of Thailand the Detroit of Asia. And they, they've, uh, it's, it's come a long way there. Uh, and the industry, just to give you an idea of how that works, uh, it's definitely reality now. There are 18 major auto manufacturers there, eight motorcycle makers, and the industry employs 100,000 workers. So it's a pretty chunky piece of business, and all the big names are there. And the automotive parts manufacturing in Thailand is critical to people around the world now. And if you remember back just a couple of years, the big floods, I think it was 2011, they had the big floods in Thailand. It affected supply chains for auto parts all over the world because they are um, they're, they're shipped everywhere now. Um, Indonesia has an installed capacity to produce two million vehicles a year. Uh, Thailand produces um, a, a quite a bit more than that already, uh, and it's up for grabs when Indonesia will actually overtake. We put uh, 2020 there. Um, the way they're going at the moment, it might take a little bit longer than that, but it's definitely going to happen sometime um, within the foreseeable, uh, the foreseeable future. Um, the uh, Gaikindo, the, uh, the Indonesian Automotive Manufacturers Association, is, is saying it's going to happen sometime in the early 20s. Uh, I, we've already held meetings, as I've said already, in other places. We've had a lot of uh, positive and useful feedback from those meetings. And I'm sure um, what Marcus is going to show you now is going to trigger some more interest. So um, feel free afterwards to, cut, to come to us with any extra questions. All the materials are, on the, are already on the website, and you'll get an invitation to download them. So no problems there. So thanks very much. Over to Marcus. OK, thank you, Peter. Let's move this. I don't have the presentation on my screen. My computer seems to not give it to me, so I might be pointing a little bit more um, towards here, uh, reading a few of the numbers. Um, but really, when we go into this, and the work that we're going to be showcasing is coming from projects that we've done over the past years in the region. Uh, we started putting together these decks towards the end of last year. So we were doing it in November, December, and we rolled it out in January and made them available and started going around and, and introducing this. So some of this information is based on secondary statistics where we've been just looking at them, uh, analyzing it in different ways to understand what the actual opportunities are, also the challenges in the market. Uh, and some of the stuff that we'll be showing is actually coming directly from primary research, which is not available anywhere else, or if other people have it, then they're not sharing it. So there's a mix for both Indonesia uh, for Indonesia, we'll be focusing on the automotive market in general, looking at the passenger vehicles and the commercial vehicle market. Whereas for Thailand, what we'll be showcasing is the aftermarket opportunity. So there we're seeing a big shift towards the aftermarket because it's been growing for quite a few years now. And the aftermarket cars or the population is starting to mature in terms of vehicles. So the opportunity there is starting to become quite interesting. So what's going on in Indonesia? Um, for those of you that know, uh, over the past years, Indonesia has been selling fewer and fewer new passenger vehicles. Uh, that being said, we are still quite gung-ho uh, positive about the overall outlook until 2020. So we do expect a growth rate of 6.8% is what we forecasted internally. Now we've taken this to some OEMs and they say we're actually 
too low. Uh, we've taken it to some suppliers and they say we're too high. So I think if some people say we're too high, some say we're too low, being in the middle is, is okay. Um, in terms of what's going to push the automotive segment, and we'll look at that in more detail, is what they call, and I've learned today that it's actually the affordable uh, car segment, but the low cost green car segment um, is a new development in Indonesia that the government has been pushing. Uh, some people say it hasn't been successful enough, but we'll see where it's come from. And we think that it's going to continue to push uh, the market and offer real opportunities for the OEMs that will be able to actually harness that. There's a lot of strings attached with this, and we'll touch on those as well. In terms of motorcycles, Indonesia is just a huge market for motorcycles. It's perhaps not as interesting for other motorcycle manu manufacturers because it is really the workhorse of the Indonesian economy, uh, transporting goods and stuff like that. But we still see a fairly interesting growth rate of 4.8% for people. And it will play a large role as they urbanize, as smaller cities um, grow and people need to become more mobile. Truck growth and bus growth, we've both looked at these trucks. Um, They've been purchasing in the past, and so we do expect a little bit of a slowdown here. Uh, within the segments, though, it's quite diverse. So overall, we're pr uh, looking at 3.5%, but what we'll show is this gasoline light duty truck segment, and that's primarily an owner operator segment, that that's really going to drive the market. So we really see at 4.6% these trucks being used for intercity, or intra-city within the cities, uh, logistics, a lot of young people going out buying trucks, um, is quite an interesting development. And then finally, for bus growth, because a lot of it is also dependent on government spending recently um, or moving forward, that it is lagging. Uh, but we do notice that the tourism industry has been earmarked by the Indonesian government to really push, uh, get more tourists in. And for this reason, we do expect then that the medium duty bus segment to grow much faster as tourism becomes more important. So what is Indonesia? Peter already mentioned it's the 400 pound gorilla in the room uh, that some people are talking about, most people don't know about. I had the opportunity to travel there a couple times last year for projects, uh, go around to not only the greater Jakarta region, but look a little bit outside. Um, I haven't been to many places, but it's very, very diverse. It's got 6,000 inhabited islands, if you think about what that actually means from a company standpoint of view. Uh, how am I going to figure out the distribution requirements? Where do I need to set up my showrooms? Uh, how am I going to actually reach out to the people that want to buy my car? What are the differences between the different islands? I mean, you have so many variables in the room um, that you need to take into account when you start thinking about what the opportunity, but also what the challenges are of going into Indonesia. And if we look at the distribution of the cities, I mean, you have 10 million in Greater Jakarta, and then it drops off. But those smaller cities, 2.8, 2.5 million people, Surabaya, Bandung, I mean, this is really where the growth is going to take place over the coming years. If the government is able to make the policy changes um, that's necessary to drive the growth, especially in the smaller cities, these are the smaller cities that people need to have on their radar if they're not there yet. We'll go and look at what some of the OEMs have been doing, and then we'll actually see uh, how far some of them are to already reach out into much smaller places. Um, but it's definitely a fairly complex country to understand. Quick macro look at what's happening population-wise and also urbanization. So this is based on a McKinsey study, and we've used that as a basis to make our own projections. But by and large, you still have a very rural population. And even by 2020, you're going to have a fairly rural population. As urbanization moves forward, there's still going to be a lot going on to 2025, even into 2030. What's interesting over the next five years um, is really that it's projected, it's expected, that there's going to be 20, 21 million new consumers uh, or consumers joining the consuming class, which is roughly estimated at or set at 3,600 US dollars per year um, at 2005 rates annual income. So owning cars is actually feasible for a small family if they save up for a few years, but car ownership is definitely achievable. If you think about other industries as well, they're starting to have money 
um, and they will be spending in over the next five years or four years now 20 million new consumers coming into the industry, uh, coming into the economy will definitely impact a lot of companies. So what we're going to talk about and focus on now, cars, uh, how big is the population? Almost 12 million. It's actually not that large if you think about it, what happens in China. Um, but then if we look at where it's going to be growing and what's been happening over the past year, as I mentioned, it's kind of in a rut right now. It's a little bit of a bump, um, but we do expect it to grow. And then what's going to be really driving it is the MPV segment. What we see from a volume standpoint of view that that's quite important. It'll remain quite important. And then what we have at the bottom there is what we call the low cost green car segment, which is going to be where the opportunity is. Now, at 8.1% and four competitors right now, it really means if it continues to grow that there's going to be volumes. We know people are going into the market. Um, we have GM that's looking to invest or has invested with its joint venture partner. Um, and other companies looking to use this as a basis for export. We see those two segments and then finally we do have the uh, SUV segment. Quite interesting uh, to see which companies try to understand what the opportunity is from a cost standpoint of view. It can't all be luxury SUVs that are going to be driving that market. So. Indonesia has been for many years now, perhaps some people say Japan's backyard. Uh, Toyota really runs and owns the market in terms of their market share. You have Honda and then you have Daihatsu and Suzuki with the small cars where they specialize in um, really basically putting everything on the road. So from a Japanese uh, OEM standpoint of view, I guess some of the key questions they'll be asking themselves is, how am I going to be able to protect my market share moving forward? As the market grows, how can I keep the consumers coming in and buying Japanese models uh, versus Western, if we think about the European brands, which are basically non-existent, or even uh, Hyundai, Kia from Korea, what actually is the opportunity for them to not only grow their current, perhaps minimal market share, but then as the market diversifies from a branding, from a communication standpoint of view, what is the value proposition that they're going to have to need to have in order to attract new customers. We do expect that this is going to change. So today, 210 models in the market. As the market matures and as new OEMs come in, new brands come in, we would expect that this is going to increase. It's very difficult to predict how many models people will be bringing in, but I would think realistically we could be looking at 230, 240 by 2020, uh, depending on how buoyant and robust the market is. We look at who's leading the market, we see Toyota has been really capable at not only bringing in different models, they've been able to localize their models, um, so they have been able to tap into consumer demand and provide uh, different vehicles, different models for different consumer segments. The dealerships, and I think from a distribution standpoint for us, when we look at Indonesia and a lot of the projects that we've done there, it always comes down to distribution. How do I get my products to the market? Where is the market that I actually need to be able to serve? And we can see Toyota and that's going to be what really their competitive advantage is moving forward in Indonesia to protect their market share. That they've been able to put up enough dealerships across the country uh, to really reach out and make sure that they're able to sell to the consumers that they're looking to tap into. So I think as we look at it and see, I mean, the difference is quite huge. If we look at Honda, which is second place in terms of total volume um, with less than half, the same amount of dealerships. So just thinking about the investment requirements, the infrastructure requirements to develop a dealership network for an OEM that's either looking to expand or also enter the market is quite interesting. You can see the level of the challenge that's there. In the different countries, so we made this slide actually for the uh, presentation in Korea because we had some people from Kia Hyundai. Uh, they've been looking at the market 
and looking at the market and haven't really decided if they're in or if they're out. Uh, they've decided to launch a new model this year. Uh, they launched one last year as well, so it seems like they're still in. Um, but they haven't really made a big commitment to what's going on in the market. And we also know that Ford exited the market this year. Um, so it's quite an interesting dynamic that some people are leaving, some people haven't decided, and other people, uh, we know for example, that Volkswagen talks a lot about Indonesia but hasn't really come up with a coherent strategy to, to really enter. Um, other people are looking at it and trying to figure out what the opportunity is. Now, if you look at these shares, and you can see from the Kager 13 to 15, that as the market started to go down, that these smaller brands are the ones that actually lost a lot. So Ford, uh, if memory serves me correctly, they were selling something around 12,000, 14,000 vehicles in Indonesia three to four years ago. So they'd actually come up and were able to, but then as the market turned over the past few years, they have really just dropped off the map and haven't been able to maintain what they've had. So Toyota has been very aggressive in maintaining market share. And it's these smaller players that haven't really figured out what their value proposition should be in the market and who they actually want to sell to. So the low cost green car segment, uh, interesting and important to understand this segment is that the government in Indonesia is using this as a footprint to, or a blueprint to try and bring uh, automotive manufacturing to Indonesia and they're offering a lot of incentives um, but also the requirement is local content requirements so they do expect uh, moving forward 80% to 100% of these cars to be produced so the components need to be produced in Indonesia it needs to be manufactured and assembled in Indonesia. Um, Toyota for example is almost able from the last chats that we've had to meet these requirements already. So they've been able to really localize and are able to produce quite complicated uh, cars already in Indonesia uh, and have also been able to take advantage of this opportunity. Uh, we see, right, five cars or five brands, it's basically five models in this market right now. But as it grows, if it really becomes a success and they want to use this also as an export strategy um, into the different ASEAN markets, that this is really where the Indonesian government is going to continue to incentivize, probably look to further develop the policy and try to attract more of the OEMs to come into Indonesia as the value chain increases in quality and complexity. For the luxury segment, perhaps more interesting, a lot of people like the shiny cars. It's very niche at the moment, I think is probably the best way to put it. It's not even at 11,000 units per year. Interesting though is when you go into it and we'll look, I mean Mercedes and BMW have really put their chips down on the table. Um, they're increasing their assembly capabilities in uh, Indonesia so they really see this as a hub to also export. And uh, with the amount of dealerships they've really been ramping up. Uh, we can look quickly at the sales figures and we also see that they primarily dominate the market. So for showrooms, I'm sure there's still lots of space. <laughs> but there's definitely movement here. I mean, there's, there's something going on. And I think from a luxury standpoint of view, if we look at the population and, and the wealthy people don't seem to be losing a lot of money right now. Um, they might not be spending as much, but the high net worth individuals in Indonesia, we parallel it also to China, that there's you know, a fairly strong wealthy class and we expect it to grow. Um, many people expect it to grow, so there is going to be continued demand for luxury vehicles. Um, and the big opportunity right now is, or the opportunity is really being taken by the German or by Mercedes and BMW. If we go back to the mass market and look at what's happening, what we want to do is just give you an idea of the pricing. Uh, obviously, it's changed a little bit since the exchange rates, but as a good proxy, you can really see, I mean, at 3,600 at 2,005 USD rates, I was told I need to make that into uh, 2016 rates. I'll figure that out soon. Um, but 6,000, these are all 2015 uh, US dollars. Uh, it's feasible, uh, low cost green car, uh, with an entry level of 6,000 US dollars is actually quite okay. 
it really makes you understand how cheap cars have also become. We look at the MPV segment entry level at 7,000. These are all prices that a lot of people will be able to afford moving forward. It, perhaps not today, but moving forward, these are realistic prices. And Toyota has been able to provide a portfolio of vehicles, of models that are entry level models uh, across the spectrum. So they're really able to serve a lot of the different, or all of the different segments at prices that are very competitive. Rounding this off, this is coming from primary research. Uh, in order to get this information, we actually had to have our teams go to these local uh, cities and then go to the registration offices to collect the registry uh, data and then clean it up and try and figure out what's been scrapped, what hasn't been scrapped, because they just keep adding on the number of vehicles that have been registered. They actually don't take them out if the car no longer exists. Um, and we've put this together to calculate the ownership population across the different cities. It's really just, again, to give you an idea of what's going on from a passenger vehicle standpoint of view, that when we look at these smaller cities, Bandung, Surabaya, or even Medan, that they all are much lower than 100 per 1,000. So it's really from an ownership, vehicle ownership uh, rate, it's very, very low. And we think specifically here, this is where we expect it to change. If you've been to Jakarta, I don't recommend driving, I don't recommend getting into a taxi, but there's actually no other option, right? There, you can't get on a bus and you can't take the subway, um, so you do end up getting stuck in traffic. Um, I haven't had the opportunity to drive in these other places, um, but I would imagine that given the level of uh, infrastructure in terms of public transport and stuff like that, that car ownership as a first step as wealth increases will definitely be a category that new consumers are looking at. Okay, so that was passenger vehicles. I want to look at the commercial vehicles. Uh, just brief macro number overview for those that do macro stuff. You probably know the numbers already. Um, I think really key here is just understanding foreign direct investment and where it's going. Um, what we're looking at is foreign direct investment and also the GDP uh, contribution to the industries. Um, we see that manufacturing is quite high that should drive commercial vehicles. We see that hospitality, we know the government is focusing on the tourism industry, so again, commercial vehicles, buses, will be important. Uh, construction is at the bottom, uh, quite low. That is obviously a key driver for um, the, the commercial vehicles, the dumpers, the tippers, anything that's in construction. Uh, if we put that together with mining, though, then it becomes very relevant once again. Now, what is happening? Uh, I don't know how many of you have actually been following what happens in Indonesia every time the government, or in the past when the government says they're going to do something, and they usually say they're going to do something, but it doesn't necessarily get done. Uh, it's kind of been the opportunity for many years that hasn't really emerged. Uh, this is what they're saying this time around. We do see, though, that they're making the right steps, the right noises, um, and actually implementing a lot of this. Um, obviously for cars, for commercial vehicles, road construction is important. This is what the plan is, um, 2,650 2, kilometers of non-toll road and another 1,000 kilometers of toll road. This will be important from a logistics standpoint of view. This will be important just for personal, private car ownership. So there is a drive to facilitate ownership of vehicles. And then the other big one, port development, because you have all of these islands, and you need to connect them somehow. Uh, there's going to have to have massive infrastructure development from a port standpoint of view, make sure that you can connect the islands. The other thing, the government is really pushing support for small and medium-sized enterprises, so they want the banks to increase the loan portfolio for smaller companies. And they've been doing this to make it more attractive with the free trade agreements, uh, specifically with Japan and China. Um, India is also in that punch. Uh, when it comes to exporting vehicles to uh, Indonesia. Down payment requirements is quite interesting. They've been loosening the requirements. So again, making it easier for people to purchase vehicles, also commercial vehicles, these gasoline light duty trucks. So they're making it easier to spend. And then the foreign direct investment has been remaining quite stable. 
So people still see it, uh, countries still see it as an opportunity. So for the trucks, the gasoline light duty truck is really one of those small, and you see them here in Hong Kong as well, it's these small trucks with a little bit on the back that really fit into those small windy roads. Um, if you're going up into Soho, you see them on the hills uh, going around. That's really what these are. Uh, and they're going to be necessary in the big cities as well as in the smaller cities just to get the stuff from A to B, especially with the level of traffic that you already have. So we really see that the GLDTs, the gasoline light duty trucks, as a proxy for understanding what's happening, not only for commercial vehicles, but kind of also for the industry and the economy as a whole, because it's going to be these small and medium-sized enterprises that are going to be driving uh, the economic development, especially outside of the greater Jakarta region. When we look at the overall market, we see that within the segments that there's actually um, a lot of concentration. And so you have the different brands that have been able to actually manage to control the different segments fairly strongly. For example, the diesel light duty trucks, although it's small and probably not growing, Mitsubishi has been really able to control it. You have within the gasoline light duty trucks, Suzuki and Daihatsu controlling it with Mitsubishi taking the other share. We think about the different OEMs, a lot of companies have their own gasoline light duty truck. Uh, there's got to be a lot of opportunity here to break into the market to offer something as well. For the medium duty trucks and then again to the heavy duty trucks, it's split Mitsubishi. Um, and then you have Haino. Isuzu has been able to grab some market share as well. But you see it's really two players in each segment, maybe three that have been able to control that segment. So we definitely see here that there's lots of opportunity. Um, figuring out how to take advantage of it is going to be the challenge. This has been a slide and also the information really understanding how ownership is linked back to the different types of trucks. So in different countries you have different type of ownership models for trucks from big fleets um, to the owner operator. I think what we see in Indonesia is fairly similar to a lot of the emerging markets that we've taken a look at. The number of large fleets is in general quite small. Um, that being said, owner operator for heavy or expensive trucks is quite limited, whereas when it gets into the cheaper, smaller trucks, you have a very high owner opera ratio. So understanding ownership, um, this will be specifically interesting in how to attract your customers when it comes to the gasoline light duty trucks, also the diesel light duty trucks, you're actually selling to a consumer. Right? He's using it for a business purpose, but at the end of the day, He's almost purchasing it similar to a consumer. He wants it serviced similar to a consumer. He owns one, two, maybe three of these trucks and is running them either with his family or maybe with a friend. But it's really almost a consumer approach to selling trucks um, that they're using to make money. The split, again, fairly rough, but we see logistics. A lot of small owner operators using their truck to ship things around within the city, and that's really driving it. It's a very fragmented logistics industry within the cities as well. And then small business owners make up the other side. They actually rent out these trucks if they're not using them um, and try and make money or keep the payments going on the side. Price-wise, if we put this back into perspective, we had entry-level, low-cost green car, 6,000 US dollars. Um, we have the light duty trucks at 7,000 for an entry level model. Um, again, I mean, we could be talking about somebody thinking about should I buy a truck and try and rent it or rent myself to drive my own truck and make money? Is that something that's viable for me to come in? And we actually have seen that in the industry. So this is really a feasible way for people to make more money or make money, um, have a livelihood, send their children to school just by having a truck, one truck, two truck, three trucks. Um, and use that as a basis to start a business. When we look at the buses, and this is the segment that perhaps is most disappointing in terms of the growth opportunity, um, 
minibuses, that's what's driving around uh, the cities. It's also being used by schools and stuff like that. Um, quite a big portion. But then the medium duty buses, which is really going to drive, if the tourism or if tourism becomes more important for the Indonesian economy and they're able to attract more global tourists, uh, then this is really going to be where we'll see the expectation of change. And similar to the trucks, it's the same split. You have the bus segments that have basically been owned or controlled by specific brands. So you have Isuzu taking up the mini buses, you have Mitsubishi with the light duty buses, and then Haino uh, again with the medium duty buses. So it's really a concentrated market again. So if you're looking to talk to them and know what's going on, it's fairly easy. If you're trying to understand then what you need to do to get into the market, it's actually fairly broad. So it's really about how to get in, understanding your value proposition and which segment you want to play in. But it's a very structured market And again, then key understanding ownership, uh, ownership distribution by segment, because this is obviously very important for the servicing. Commercial vehicles need to be serviced. So how you're going to sell, how you're going to service these vehicles, once they're sold, is going to be really important to understand who's actually owning them. What, what are they doing? How are they purchasing them? So we have, again, mini buses, owner operators, medium fleets for the medium duty buses, large fleets, quite non-existent. Similar to the passenger vehicle slide, we did the same exercise for population ownership um, in the different cities. So again, you can see that Jakarta takes up most of the bus population as well as the truck population. And as soon as you get into those smaller cities, it's really, I mean, these are cities that have 2.5 million people. I mean, these are not small in terms of just limited population. Um, they're quite large. and if the economic growth is going to come, this is what's going to be impacted. These are the large second tier cities that we're looking at and it's very, very low. So we would expect here that this is where the opportunity is going to be. And this is where companies that want to take advantage of this opportunity really need to understand how to service it. Finalizing with some trends uh, about ownership and also about purchasing, what we've looked at and tried to understand is how it's being purchased, what's the sophistication in the purchasing model for trucks and also for buses. So we can look at it, you basically have three separate models, either you have a structured purchasing process, something in between, or you don't really have a purchasing department and it's just done on the side. And then you can see that the split is really on the truck side no real purchasing model um, makes it very difficult if you're trying to sell anything from spare parts, lubricants or anything to them. It means you need to have a fairly strong and sophisticated market understanding to reach these people. Whereas on the other side, with a purchasing department but without branch offices, it's really that, right? You're dealing with a lot of small to medium-sized companies in the different regions, which means that your service model or your sales model has to be able to make sure that you can touch out to this amount of different people. And finally, if you've been following the news, we have driverless cars, we also have driverless trucks. Uh, we're looking to see driverless fleets probably fairly soon, at least on the highways of North America and Europe. Um, but in Indonesia, we still need the highways and the adoption of bigger or more complicated technologies is, is quite limited. So anything from telemetrics, GPS usage, all of these things are still very, very limited. We see a little bit in Greater Jakarta and Surabaya and other places it's not even being adopted. Uh, what that specifically means is you need to know what people are willing to buy. Uh, trying to sell them very fancy gadgets uh, that could potentially save them costs is great, but they're probably not interest, interested. There's not a lot of expectation here that adoption is going to be very quick across the different cities.
So that's the overview of what's happening in Indonesia. What we want to talk about now is the Thailand aftermarket, specifically the independent aftermarket, and why it's actually interesting. From a total population standpoint of view, we're really expecting to see 14 million units by 2020 um, that are out of warranty. So if you think about what was happening in Indonesia, we just talked about the total population being under 12. Uh, in Thailand, we're going to have 14 million units that are going to be out of warranty. All of these will need to be serviced somehow. Uh, five million of these are going to be between that age of three and eight years old, where people actually buy used cars, people invest in their car, people repair their car. Um, in comparison to once it gets old, they just want to keep it running, and they don't really care what they put into it. Used car, the used car market in Thailand is fairly sophisticated. Uh, you have financing options, uh, used cars, to a certain extent, also receive warranties. These are all very important to make sure that people are confident to buy used cars. Don't know if anyone's bought a used car before, but there's always that idea of buying a melon, buying a lemon, buying something that's probably not going to run. You get worried about buying something you don't understand. Same in Thailand. They're moving forward to make sure it's much more structured and that the consumers aren't being cheated. This is really important. Uh, Bangkok will look at the distribution, will remain the center. Um, but we'll see the different regions very interesting as the country develops. Uh, key regions that people didn't really expect are going to drive the aftermarket, especially from a purchasing of the used car, used cars. When it comes to the channel, we have certified and uncertified uh, workshops. Um, really here is going to be a lot of opportunity um, for these certified workshops to become certified. It means that they need to pass the test receive the certification from the insurance companies. This will be important. It means there's going to be a lot of upgrading, training requirements. Um, and then you also have these new, what we have highlighted as branded service providers. So it's basically like chains that are starting to develop and move through Thailand as well. And then finally, it's the consumers that don't really know much about independent aftermarket brands. So while there's still a lot of expectation that they need to buy something that's an OEM brand, um, they're also very price sensitive. And so as they learn, are educated, um, understand that the quality parts in the independent aftermarket are also an opportunity for them to save money um, without necessarily worrying about whether it'll work, um, that this will be very interesting, a big opportunity for these brands. In 2012, 2013, the government came up with a car scheme. They wanted to get more new cars on the road. Uh, there was a little bit of a dip in the economy, so they thought the best thing that they could do was subsidize the new car sales. That's exactly what they did, and they were very successful. You can see that um, they sold roughly 400,000 new vehicles a year uh, on average in both of those years. These cars are now coming into that three-year-old out-of-warranty uh, age bracket and that's really what's going to be driving then this three to eight year old age bracket for used cars for the out of warranty population again we have a very strong presence of the Japanese brands they've been owning the market for a long time they own the brands in the aftermarket as well um, when you look at it Similar to Indonesia, you had Toyota with a portfolio that's able to really reach across all of the different segments. Uh, when it comes into the other brands, though, they've been playing specifically in areas that's relevant for them. Isuzu pickup trucks, uh, you have Honda that's been focusing on sedans, and you have Mitsubishi as well. Pickup trucks has been the primary focus. So again, you have a different split. And this is very important because for people in the independent aftermarket, they have to feel confident that they can go into a service channel that's able to service the vehicle type that they're also driving. Most people go to Thailand for the sun and for the beaches. Uh, I myself have never been to the northern portion of Thailand, but that's what the numbers say at least is where the, dro dro where the growth is going to be coming from. So what we've done is we've broken it down. You have the PV ownership, you have the average monthly household income, and again, the percentage of the uh, population. And if you look past Bangkok, it's the northeast and it's the north that really has the numbers population-wise, um, has ownership quite low, 
uh, and from an income standpoint of view is really then that bracket that needs to or will have to if they want to own a car also think about purchasing a used car so this is really going to be driving the independent aftermarket used car uh, sales will be driven by the north and the northeast region the good thing about thailand is at least for the automotive industry the government tracks it and keeps a lot of the data for used car sales they actually track inventory so they track the used cars that are being sold to the dealers as well as the used cars that the dealers are selling back to the population. So you can see here that the inventory, that's what the stock of used car for sale is and then what they're actually selling. And if you look at both of the charts in the second hand, sorry, on the right hand side, you see that the price has dropped. So as they subsidize the new car sales, the price of used car uh, dropped significantly and in comparison to uh, 2011, the price is still much lower, uh, which really means that those, new, those newly used cars, I suppose, those three-year-old used cars, four-year-old used cars, are starting to become very attractive at prices that are lower than what they were a couple of years ago. So looking specifically at the transfer or the sale of the used cars, again, we see the north and the northeast after Bangkok being the key regions of where the volumes are going. That's what we want to show here as well. In terms of trying to understand how they're being sold, we've tried to count them. We can only tell you that there's more than 4,000 independent outlets nationwide. So again, it's a very unstructured used car market, people, mom and pop oper operations that are selling used cars. So to get in to understand how used cars are being sold um, takes a lot of energy, takes a lot of uh, information requirements. That being said, these used car dealerships actually don't offer maintenance services. It's very rare for them to have a used car dealership plus a garage. Something that I found quite interesting, it means that they've separated these two functions. Um, could mean it's more complicated. Who they do work with, though, are these financing companies. And so it's become very cheap, very easy to purchase a used car. Um, right, we talk about the loan value, 80% of the used car price, they'll give it to you. Um, six years payment period, okay. Uh, right, you can get the loan within a day. Um, it's pretty scary, actually, if you think about how easy it is based on what we see here to go out and purchase a new used car. Uh, that being said, they're also offering the warranty for the used car, which means that the insurance companies are quite confident that they can be serviced in certified channel uh, and they won't be using fake parts, they won't be stealing or they won't be somehow uh, trying to cheat the system. So it's really moving forward to have a very structured channel for the used car market. I'm not sure how many of you look at the e-channel um, for the automobile industry. Uh, if we look at, for example, in China, we see that e-commerce is something that's very exciting. Uh, for the automotive industry, it's still supposed to be what's going to happen, and it's the big opportunity that nobody really seems to know how to use yet. Um, that being said, when we look at Thailand, e-commerce is not really existent. Uh, people aren't buying, they're buying online, don't get me wrong, but for the automobile industry, uh, for buying any type of uh, things that are automotive related, uh, e-commerce uh, purchasing online, we don't expect that to be relevant for the next few years at all. That being said, if you're interested from a part standpoint of view, if you're interested from an accessory standpoint of view, and you need distribution partners, you're going to have to find one of these general parts distributors or also a parts retail shop because everything goes through them. So there's a distribution layer that's really important um, that we see. The branded service provider, as they get more sophisticated, they will start developing stronger centralized purchasing models. But even today, when we look and go into the different outlets, we see that what you can buy in one outlet is not necessarily available in the other outlet. So it's still a very unstructured uh, process. Before, this slide had a lot more information on it, so I've tried to reduce it. I know it's probably still not legible. Important, though, is the top 
line number of outlets. If we think about where it's at, branded service providers, there's a few brands that are leading the market, but overall there's not a lot of them out there. It's 500, um, mainly in the key urban areas, but that's really not a lot. So here, a huge opportunity. They're growing very fast. We'll look at that in a moment. Then we have the certified independent workshop. Again, double what you have in terms of branded service providers, but still, if you really think about what they need to service moving forward, not ready yet to deal with the amount of volume that's going to be coming over the next five years and in the future. And then you have this big uncertified channel, and that's exactly what it is. Nobody really knows where they purchase, how they purchase, what they put into the car, um, but it's also the only opportunity that a lot of people have to get their car serviced. It's just there, that's what you use. And so as this environment changes, as the industry becomes more sophisticated, uncertified independent workshops is going to have to decrease um, just by nature and the certified independent workshops will increase and that's going to be where a large opportunity is for anybody that's trying to sell into this channel, get people to fix cars. From a equipment standpoint of view, what we did is we wanted to go in and look at what actually they have. And so we've been able to compare the branded service providers to the certified independent workshops to the uncertified independent workshops. And you can see that it varies quite a lot. So in terms of the level of sophistication, types of equipment that they're using within the markets, um, you can see, and even if we just look at, for example, the first line, diagnostic testing equipment, Right? The gap between the certified independent workshop to the uncertified independent workshop is quite large. Um, if we're looking at the repair shop pit, again, right, in many cases, they just don't have the necessary infrastructure or requirements to service correctly. And in order to be able to do that, that's or getting independent or uncertified workshops to that level to become certified is going to require a lot of investment on the one side, but also this is where the opportunity is going to be. We look at what they can actually service, or what they think they can service at least. And again, you see that there's quite a big difference between uh, the different channels. So if we look at, for example, manual transmissions, um, obviously the dealerships are able to do it, the branded service providers not, um, quite sophisticated for them. Um, the certified independent workshops much more, but then the uncertified independent workshops, again, maybe half of them. So if you own a car and it breaks down and it's your manual transmission, right now you're actually very limited to where you can go. If you're lucky, you can get into the certified independent workshop channel. If you're not, where do you go? I mean, do you have to go to an uncertified independent workshop where they pretend or think that they can actually service you? It's a big issue right now, especially for car owners that don't necessarily have enough money and need to make sure that their car gets repaired correctly. Cockpit is the largest by total outlets a branded service provider today. I have not had a chance myself to go and visit one of these outlets. I got a lot of pictures though. Um, for me, interesting is really if we look at the total number again. It's 175 outlets. I mean, great business. I wish I had it myself. In terms of the bigger Thailand picture, though, that again is really small. If we think 79% right, are outside, but Bangkok is 20% of their portfolio, um, there's still a lot of room to go outside into where Thailand is uh, outside of the greater Jakarta area. You think about the opportunity for these companies, they look at it, uh, how do I expand? What type of products do I need to have? What should my portfolio look like? How can I make sure my products get to all of my outlets? There's a lot here that's going to be challenging for them to expand. And again, from a manufacturer standpoint of view, if you're looking at accessories, helping them getting in early is definitely something that we should be looking at. When we talk to the consumers uh, and talk to them about the independent aftermarket, the key criteria, parts quality makes a lot of sense. Second, brand. If we look at 
the preference between OEM and non-OEM, then we see they prefer OEM. We didn't put the question, do you actually know any independent aftermarket brands into the survey because it's not really fair. Um, but when we talk to them outside of the survey, it's, they don't really know. Right? They prefer OEM because that's what they're told is good and what's relevant for them. Um, but price or value for money is very, very important for them as well. And so there's this gap between understanding I need quality, but I only know OEM brands that I can use in the aftermarket. And this education requirement or this gap in knowledge is where the independent aftermarket brands are really going to have to focus on in order to convince consumers that their products are just as of high quality and can be used as well. Finally, and this is also quite important, uh, is really gauging the level of comfort that consumers have in terms of what they would specifically want to have repaired uh, versus where they would go to repair it. So tires, obviously people can do it on their own as well, uh, versus your brakes, uh, they want to go to a dealership to get those repaired, um, at least half of them, perhaps because they don't know where else to go or they just don't trust the uh, other channel. Okay, this is the last slide from this. Um, if there's any questions, open up the floor for questions. I hope that you found at least some of this information to be interesting, uh, to give you a better idea of what's going on in these two markets. Thank you. Um, I just have a question about, do I have to stop? Okay. <laughs> um, if the second-hand car market in Thailand is growing so much. How do you see that impacting the entry-level car market in Thailand? Do you think that it will take away sales from there? And will people, instead of deciding to buy a new entry-level car, they're going to be going for perhaps a fancier but used car? How do you see that? I think what we've seen from the actual price aspect from the used car is that there's actually a lot of inventory right now. And so for them to get rid of that inventory, they really need to offer more or highly competitive prices. So I think right now where we're really looking at in the used car market, we have a segment that is definitely much below an entry level new passenger vehicle for people to purchase. And so I think if we look at also the income disparity within Thailand, um, there's a lot of companies, or sorry companies, a lot of consumers that want a new vehicle or a second new vehicle. Um, whereas there's a lot of areas where a new vehicle is just not an option. And the used car is at that point where there's enough volume and at a price point where they're going to be shipping these used cars into that area, um, specifically in the north and the northeast. On that note, we also expect used cars to actually be exported potentially from Thailand into the markets. You have Myanmar and you have Laos that are close by. So we'd also potentially see more export of used cars into those markets. It's kind of a below new entry level point. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I'll ask about, it seems that the ASEAN countries are uh, mainly dominated by the um, Japanese OEMs. Just wondering if, um, what's the opportunity for other OEMs and uh, what do you think is the reason behind it is the brand names or is it the strategy that um, basically other OEMs don't want to entry the market? And um, second is, uh, for Thailand, uh, you said the e-commerce is basically non-existent right now and then you don't foresee it to be, um, you know, uh, going to develop very well in the future. Uh, why is that? Is it um, the consumer practice or is it um, the participants are not um, pushing enough in this area? I'll start with the easy one, <laughs> that's e-commerce. Um, e-commerce in Thailand for the automotive segment uh, is not very strong or is not very relevant. So what we're looking at here is, or what we've seen in other markets is people purchasing lubricant online um, and then taking it to a shop and getting the shop owner or the, the mechanic to change the oil. 
um, or they're buying wipers or they're buying accessories online and then trying to get them installed somewhere. Um, this has been the first steps in the e-commerce channel that we've seen uh, specifically in Western countries uh, where people have a lot more knowledge of what they need to buy and also in China where they're trying to link up service shops with consumers to facilitate that by offering cheap prices for specific things. Uh, we don't see that happening in Thailand right now. I think primarily it's an education issue. People wouldn't know what to purchase. Um, they haven't really purchased these types of products online in the past. And so if they were going to do it, if they needed to install their own windshield wipers, if they needed to change something, they would still have to take it to another shop. And so this whole aspect of buy and bring versus do it for me on the consumer side, it's still very do it for me and I want the mechanic to do it, but if I buy my own stuff and then expect them to do it, is there still a lot of acceptance in the market for this type of practice? So that's why we don't see that this is going to be relevant within the coming years, specifically for the automotive segment. The other question was about Western or non-Japanese OEMs into Indonesia. Um, from what we've been able to understand and gather, the Japanese came very early um, and have been able to develop very strong government ties. Uh, this is specifically important because they've been able to suck up, perhaps would be the best way to put it, a lot of the assembly capacity and have been able to, to a certain extent, at least monopolize it as well. So you don't have a lot of very highly qualified assemblers in Indonesia um, for other OEMs to work with. So for them to come into the market, they actually need to make a much bigger investment in terms of building up the assembly capabilities, finding specific partners that they can work together with. We had a chance to talk to Mazda in Japan. Uh, it's specifically one of the key issues that they said. They said they want to be in Indonesia. The problem is exporting to Indonesia is still quite expensive, um, where you have to compete with the assembly and manufacturing capabilities of Toyota that's there and they can produce at a much cheaper price. So there's really that aspect there about the quality of the value chain and the capability of the local labor force to provide or to be able to assemble and manufacture. So for the entry level or mass market vehicle, that's definitely a competitive issue. Uh, I think the other aspect is We've seen, for example, Ford exit the industry. We've seen Hyundai, Kia um, hasn't really decided what they want to do in Indonesia. So you have uh, Hyundai assembling some. Uh, what they assemble in Indonesia is buses, for example, small buses. Uh, they assemble a few other vehicles, but it doesn't really seem like what they're assembling there is really relevant for the mass market. And then they're importing to Indonesia from India because of the trade agreement that Indonesia has with India. Um, and then Kia is exporting directly from Korea to uh, Indonesia, which makes it quite expensive, again, for their cars to come in. So I think there is an issue that a lot of OEMs haven't really figured out what they want to do in Indonesia today. So they don't necessarily have the correct portfolio strategy uh, for the market. I think it's inevitable that the, uh, the luxury cars as, as, a, sorry, as the country gets wealthier, and you saw on one of the graphs that they are getting wealthier, it's inevitable that there will be an emergence of a luxury car sector. And it, already BMW and Mercedes are in there. And if BMW and Mercedes are in there, Audi are going to be in there as well. So it's, it's, it's almost inevitable. It's just a question of when and how it happens. Yeah, thank you for the, the presentation. Uh, I'm currently a professor with City University of Hong Kong. Uh, before I joined the university, I was in the consulting business. Um, I did a dissertation regarding the uh, motorization and vehicle purchase uh, and use behavior in China. Uh, at that time, we see the two types of people. One is people only purchase the vehicle um, based on the pricing. Second is people uh, to do the luxurious or, you know, um, you know, status-seeking behavior, so purchase a vehicle for showing off, no matter they have a driver's license or not. Uh, do you see the same situation happening in Southeast Asia? 
And uh, as, as we also noticed, uh, currently in China, you know, the, uh, the luxurious vehicle is reshaping the, uh, the product. For example, Audi and other uh, companies try to cross over with other uh, more the IT oriented, you know, the Apple car, those type of things. Do you see this happening uh, in Thailand or Indonesia? Uh, that's it, thank you. It's a broad question. <laughs> um, interestingly, when we were in Indonesia and in Jakarta, one of the key topics that people were talking about, I think Peter brought this up as well, was why is Tesla, or what is Tesla doing? Why has Tesla not come into the market yet? Um, basically, it was because the Indonesian government hasn't really figured out what kind of policies they're going to develop, um, specifically in terms of supporting the development of infrastructure. So there might be interest um, from the more luxury level uh, to have something of that type of car, but there's just no government support at the moment. Um, when we looked at Indonesia from the consumer standpoint of view, mass market, I think what we've seen at this point in time, because cars are still very new for a lot of people, that regardless of the model or the brand that they're purchasing right now, it's still a very aspirational step for them. Owning a car for the first time, which is uh, for a lot of the people the case, is really one of the key drivers to showcase that they've moved up, they've become middle class. And we expect that that's going to be a key driver moving forward. Um, and it's going to remain that way roughly over the three, five years uh, coming up. The challenge that we see and where we see that it's going to be interesting is as the number of models increase, as the number of brands that are looking at the market and looking to enter the market or increase uh, their sales in the market increases, that the value proposition, what you're selling to them, what type of inspiration or aspiration are you selling to them, that's going to be where a lot of the competition uh, is going to be taking place. So really, how do I identify the different sub-segments of the consumers today? Today, it's much more bland from a consumer standpoint of view. So I think there. In terms of owning a luxury vehicle, I think you'll probably have that in every market. Right? Anybody who's got a lot of money and can buy something that's very expensive, even if they don't drive it, right? it's going to be there as well. I think for Thailand, it's a little bit different because they've already been owning cars much longer and it's already gone from a pickup truck market into you have eco cars, you have different levels of car ownership. I think there, the uptake in different brands, the luxury brands are already there, the exposure has been there, um, that you're going to see a change there much more quickly, and we're going to see the level of sophistication and consumer demands also change much more rapidly towards some of the things that you mentioned. I think that's where the Japanese OEMs are going to get into trouble actually, is because the consumers are going to expect more much more quickly, and that's going to help the Western brands um, capture market share more quickly. I think that's, does that help answer the question? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. It's already quarter to two, so I hope nobody has stayed past the time to go back to work. <laughs> uh, happy to answer any other questions on the side. Okay, thank you.